Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, how many of you enjoyed getting dropped off under uh, the canopy this morning? Uh, that's not the driver, of course. He, the, he or she had to go park, but uh, boy, what a blessing the rain is. I know you would agree with me. We thank God for all the good things that he gives us, and rainfall this morning is just one of those many great gifts from God. We're here to worship and want to welcome you. Also want to welcome those who are joining us online. During this time, I would ask that uh, your prayer and my prayer would be to hear from God, to draw closer to the Lord Jesus, that my faith would be renewed and strengthened as we're together. Amen. Good morning. Please stand. Let's remember the Lord your God is among you. He's here right now, a warrior who saves. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will be quiet in his love. He will delight in you with singing. And that's from Zephaniah 317. Let's lift our voices now as we sing, Mighty to Save. says there is no one holy like the Lord indeed there is no one beside you nor there is any rock like our God amen, amen. let's join in singing only a holy God Oh 
verses this morning is Colossians chapter 3, 12 through 15. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgive each other, as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, which, to which indeed you were called in one body. Be thankful. Thank you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come this morning. We're thanking you for the rain that we're getting right now. We thank you so much for this new building and, a, and that we can come to worship. Thank you for our pastor and ask you to be with him this morning as he leads us. In the name of your son, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Well, I know I see so many faces I've seen for all my life. Oh, my gosh. Um, so those of you I don't know, I uh, was a member here at First Baptist for 39 years. I told my husband and I got married and he moved me to Liberty. So it's nice to be back. I just want to give a kind of a brief uh, what my husband and I do in Ghana and West Africa. We run an organization called Isaac's Dream. We started it to... Um, basically save children from human trafficking and child slavery. So we have about 400 students that come to, that go to our school. Um, there's a couple of photos of how we get, yes, so uh, the reason why we have so many kids that need education and need protecting is because this is how we get there every day. Our, there's no road to our village, so every day there's no way our kids can go to school. So uh, they had never had a school. They'd been there for over 50 years. So that's why we decided to fight human trafficking uh, through education. So now we have about 400 students who can't be trafficked and can't get involved in child slavery because they have a school to go to now. So that is uh, very exciting. We've also, over the years, been working on baptism. We're still kind of living in the Old Testament over there, so we're moving on into the New Testament. And we hired uh, someone this year to start teaching religion classes. So this year, we had nine kids that were baptized for the first time ever that have been out there. So we were very privileged to get to be a part of that. And uh, we enjoyed Abby. She was awesome on the trip. So uh, we have a short video of something that kids had been working on uh, while we were gone.
right, so that video and that dance was actually like um, a really huge milestone and it was kind of emotional for all of us because that song was talking about, you know, Jesus and as Robin said, they were getting them used to that aspect and so that was, um, I think Robin said even the chief almost cried because of that song and that dance. So that was a very special one that we wanted to share with you guys. Um, so our trip was crazy at first, of course, because the plane rides always are. And um, we landed in Accra, which is the capital of Ghana. And um, we spent the first couple days um, just like touring the area and like seeing the culture and eating the, all of their food, which was really good, by the way. And um, we went on different, like we went to a national park and it was actually really crazy. The bridges were like super narrow and it was across the sky and you like couldn't look down otherwise you'd get dizzy. And um, so we did that and we also went to the um, Cape Coast Castle, which is a old um, slavery um, where they would yeah, it was where slavery originated, and so we got to learn about that from their country's point of view, which was really interesting and very eye-opening. And so I, we really appreciated that they were that Robin and Joe incorporated that part into the trip. And then after that, we, tro we drove eight hours to get to Yeji, where is where we stayed for five days, and we went. And every day we went on a drive and we would um, go on a canoe. It took about an hour each day to get to the village. And every day in the village we would do a lesson, we would do games, we would do crafts. And, you know, one of the, everyone always tells you that the greatest part is the kids. And that is, of course, 100% true because nothing is greater to them. It's just amazing that you're there. And so there's nothing more warming than just, like, Robin and Joe would always remind us that, like, it doesn't matter how much you mess up, they're going to love every single thing that you do. And that's true. They literally, they appreciate you so much for just being there. And that was a very inspiring thing and a very encouraging thing, especially, you know, being away from home and being away from your family. It was... It was amazing seeing how much they were just so joyful and they were so loving and kind and they were a little crazy sometimes too, but <laughs> that was the challenging part. Um, so I think the first day we went into the village, me and another girl named Clancy, we did our lesson and um, I th there was two to three hundred kids, I think, and there was just five of us going on that trip and so it was crazy and challenging trying to get them all to listen, trying to get them all to engage in what we were teaching and the crafts and all of those things. And um, Mavis, who was our translator, she was also the second grade teacher. She was personally very inspiring to me and I know that she was to others because she's just very engaged and animated and she just knows how to grab the kids' attentions in ways that like I've never seen before. And she's just so passionate about what she's speaking. She could have preached all on, her, all on her own. She didn't need us. And so that was very inspiring and very encouraging to get to see her just so on fire for Jesus. Um, we also would spend a lot of our time with this man named Victor, who is their contractor. He was um, also equally as inspiring because he just, he loved Jesus so much the way he spoke um, when we were doing devotionals every night the way he would just talk about the people in the village and how much he loved them and how much he wanted to see God work in them and in the village you can just tell that he was very very passionate about the work that he was doing with Isaac Stream and that was also very inspiring to get to see him just so adamant about these things that were necessary for them to prosper, for God to work, and so that was amazing. I think one of my favorite parts about the whole trip was every night we would do devotionals with just our group, with us five and um, Victor sometime, Victor most of the time, and every once in a while Mavis would join. And my favorite part was everyone 
was would get to share about their days and how they saw God work in different ways and how God worked in their hearts and around them. And getting to see that was just, it's very eye-opening getting to see people explain God working in different ways because you only can see things from your own perspective. And so getting to listen to other people talk about how God was passionately working in their hearts, it was just It was very inspiring, and we would do devotionals together, and getting to hear everybody share their point of views on what we were talking about, and getting to hear people explain how God was just so amazing, and how he was just working so much, and it was just, it was very inspiring to get to to hear all of them talk, and there were definitely some moments that we had where we would lay hands on other people and pray over them, and I've never done that before. That was my first time ever laying hands on people and praying in a group, and that was very nerve-wracking for me, but I did it, and so it was, it was just amazing getting to grow as a, as a Christian in my walk, and so, yep. Um, so we spent five days in the village, and oh yes, uh, this is a picture of the kids. There's actually a few of these pictures that I took, um, and each picture I took, there were more and more kids that joined the photo, and (laughs) that was, that was, yes, you do, and so that was, that was pretty cool. Um, There is a picture of us sitting around the table, and I took that one because that was, you know, when we were doing devotionals and stuff, and it's a simple photo, but like I said, a lot happened during those nights around those tables talking about talking about God and how amazing he was and so that was a pretty great experience um and then this is this is Mavis in the pool and we were teaching her how to swim because they're they live in a fishing community but the only people who know how to swim are the fishermen and Mavis was not a fisherman she's a teacher (laughs) so she had no idea how to swim, so um, after we left the village, after we spent five days, we went to Moli National Park, um, and we went on a safari there, and we got to see all the animals, and our hotel was in the middle of the park, and they had a pool, and so we got to teach Mavis how to swim. Victor refused to get in the pool. He said he already knew how to swim, but we didn't believe him. <laughs> um, and um, it was, the Moli Park was really great. Um, we would walk out of our hotel, and we didn't know if there was an antelope or if there was a baboon that was angry and wanted to attack us. So, (laughs) but it was really beautiful getting to see all the culture. That was another great experience was getting to see the culture and getting to see people in their element and how they live their lives differently, so much differently from ours. And so that was a great part of the trip as well. That was one of the best ones. And, um, Yeah, then we worked our way home, and that was a mess in and of itself, but that's that's another story. Um, Yeah, thank you. Before they go down, let's have a prayer for uh, the work that is continuing through Isaac's dream and that dream that God placed on uh, Robin and Joe's heart. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you're doing in us in our community, and around the world. God, we've heard what you did just a few weeks ago on this trip in in Ghana, God, and we pray for what is continuing to take place there. We thank you for uh, this ministry, uh, Isaac's dream, and the the children whose lives it's touched, certainly bettering their lives, uh, giving protection and education. And Lord, we also thank you for those who are hearing about Jesus and those who recently made that eternal decision. So continue Oh, God, to bring glory to your name, bring people to salvation. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you. Please stand. Let's join in saying, great is thy faithfulness. He's always faithful to us, isn't he?
he's faithful, isn't he? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are, for your nature and character. And one of those attributes that we read about in Scripture is your faithfulness. It's not just something we've read about. It's what we've experienced. So we praise you and thank you for your goodness to us day by day. In times we haven't even recognized it, and we failed to say thank you. Lord, we pause this morning to give you thanks, to praise you, to exalt you. As we study your word together this morning, oh God, give us understanding. May we think about your forgiveness of us and the need that we have, certainly to receive your forgiveness, but also to give forgiveness in all of our relationships. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you be seated? Show you a picture of Melvin Burns. Uh, he's the one on the right. <laughs> Just want to clarify that. Back in August of 2017, a string of thefts at his free range livestock operation made uh, it very difficult for him to continue his operation. So he made a plea and offered a job to the thief if the thief would just return his tools. You see, he runs the Mune Farms in Cooksbrook, Nova Scotia, and there'd been a string of burglaries around him. Uh, he had lost about $5,000 worth of animals, including six pigs and 10 chickens, and then a second robbery, he lost $1,000 worth of tools that were vital to his operation so he decided to go on Facebook and offer two rewards. The first reward was if anyone would come forward with a tip that would lead to the recovery of his tools, then he would give that person five pounds of the best Berkshire bacon. I don't know if you've priced bacon lately, but that's a pretty good deal. And then he had another proposal. If the thief would just turn himself or herself in, Burns would give them a job teach them how to farm, and teach them agricultural skills. He would give his personal training to make them employable so that they might have respect. He said, please, if you need money and are close to the farm, I offer you labor. I offer you my time to use constructively. You can earn money, respect, and a future in this community. Now, you don't need to raise your hand, but how many of us would offer somebody employment if they had stolen from us. Seems like a pretty gracious offer. Now, I know what you're thinking. Did anybody take him up on it? Well, the last time I checked on a follow-up to this story, nobody had given a tip. He hadn't sliced any bacon, and nobody had returned the tools. And yet, I think you would agree with me, a pretty generous offer. Why is it? When we are hurt or wronged, why is it so hard to forgive the one who has hurt or has wronged us? And it's not just if they have hurt us personally. Isn't it also a challenge to forgive when they have hurt somebody that we care about? Forgiveness is tough. Amen? And yet, that's what God offers to us, his forgiveness and what God challenges us to offer to other in all of our relationships. Would you stand, please, as I read from God's Word, Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. Then Peter came up and said to him, to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with the servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. 
So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and he went and he put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. They went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This is the word of God. Amen. Amen. Would you be seated, please? Well, Peter <clears throat> is the disciple who asks the question that sets the scene for Jesus' story, a parable that he would give on forgiveness. Peter's question was very simply this, and it's one that you've asked before. How often must we forgive? And we've all been there, and we've all asked it. So this is right where we live, isn't it? Peter asked, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And Peter offered a suggestion, as many as seven times. Seven is a common biblical number for completeness. And it goes well beyond the current uh, teaching of the first century rabbis. First century rabbis said that if someone wronged you, you could forgive them three times and after three times, you were no longer obligated to forgive. Now, we kind of have something like that, right? Three strikes and you're... It's kind of the same idea, isn't it? I'll forgive you once, maybe twice, maybe three times. That was the common practice. But after that, you're off the hook. No longer do you have to forgive. And so Peter, when he said seven times... Let's give Peter at least a little bit of credit. He doubled it and added one. But that was not enough. Because Jesus wanted us to understand that the forgiveness of God, the grace of God, has no bounds. Have you experienced that in your life? The goodness of God, His grace, His forgiveness, so that God's forgiveness is not limited. God doesn't put boundaries of what, around that he'll forgive this, but he won't forgive that. If you come in repentance, we're going to get to that near the end of the message this morning, but what Jesus is teaching is that forgiveness has no bounds. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Now, if you have the King James Version, the um, a Christian Standard Bible, Amplified New King James, it will say 70 times seven. Do the math there. How much is that? 490. Uh, the ESV, New American Standard, NIV, translates the same Greek word, so it can be translated either uh, the 70 times 7, 490, or it can be translated 77 times. So no doubt Jesus stunned Peter with his reply. So either way, 77 or 490, Jesus is not giving us a new mathematical equation to keep track of. You know, you can keep track of three, you can keep track of seven, but Jesus was not saying now the new math is 78 or 491, and then you can forget. No, Jesus is talking about completeness and multiplies it considerably. Now, few people have ever had to forgive the same person as many as 491 times, unless you're married. <laughs> That's for another day, right? But Jesus' point is not to withhold forgiveness after you reach a certain point, but to live a life that is gracious and kind and good to all around us. Now, let's just hasten to say that is easy to talk about and impossible to do. Amen? Amen? Some of you aren't being honest. The theme that Jesus is going to elaborate on in this very straightforward story 
is that we as the people of God should be so generous and willing to demonstrate mercy and forgiveness to others because we have received mercy and forgiveness from God. You see, God forgives our sin debt, a sin debt that we could never possibly repay. The scripture tells us that we are saved by grace through faith that not of ourselves, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, lest we should boast. There is no way that any one of us, that any person can possibly pay back our debt to God, our debt of sin. We simply can't. So Jesus gives this parable of a king settling accounts with his servants. Now you heard as I read the story, but let me just go back over the simple teaching in this parable. A king calls his people in who owe him money in order to settle accounts. One particular servant is called in who owes a vast sum of money, an amount that he would never be able to repay. And so, as the king demands repayment immediately, calls in the debt, the servant begs for mercy because the king says that you and your family will be sold in order to recoup a portion of the money that you owe. He begs for mercy. And Jesus said the king has pity on him. And the king, he does something amazing. He doesn't simply spare the man's family and say, then you go to jail. He doesn't reduce the amount of the debt and say, I'll cut it in half. He doesn't extend the terms and say, okay, instead of paying me today, then I'm going to extend how long you have. He did something unimaginable. The king erased the entire debt with one word, forgiven. Now, this debt-free servant. Now, many of you listen to Dave Ramsey. You've heard people call into the radio show and declare that they were now debt-free. It's an amazing thing to be debt-free. But it's even more amazing to be sin-free because of forgiveness. Amen? And so this debt-free servant heads out of the king's presence. And no sooner than he leaves the king's presence than he runs into a fellow servant who owes him In comparison, what is a significant amount, but a petty amount compared to what he had just been released from. And this debt-free servant does what any debt-free servant would do, I suppose. He demands immediate payment from the one who owed him. Like the debt-free servant... This second servant begs for mercy. In fact, except for one word, it is the exact same plea. Have patience with me and I will repay you, is what the second servant said. The first servant, who's the debt-free servant, says, have patience with me to the king and I will pay you everything. What's interesting about that first servant was there was no possible way to forgive or to repay everything. So the first plea actually had no basis. If I gave you multiple lifetimes, you couldn't repay. But the second servant who said, give me time and I will repay you, he actually was asking for something possible. You know what happened? The debt-free servant refused to offer forgiveness. And he had that second servant thrown into jail. The explanation of the money, because we don't deal in talents and denarii, and you reach into your pocket or get your purse out, you're not going to find any denarii in there, right? So it kind of loses a little bit on us unless we try to make sense 
Ed Gravely, in an explanation, said that literally the Greek number for talent is the word myriad. You all heard the word myriad, right? Well, that was the Greek word that's translated talent in our English. It was actually not a unit of money. It was a unit of, um, of measure. And so it's interesting, modern historians tell us that a, a denarius, so that's the singular, denarii is plural, that a denarius equaled one day's wage for a common laborer or for a soldier. So there's much debate about what a talent was actually worth because it was a unit of measure and not a unit of money. And yet speculation is that one talent would equal around 100 denarii up to 6,000 denarii. So in other words, one talent would equal what is comparable to four months of a common laborer's wage or up to 20 years of a common person's wage. So think about what the minimum wage is now. So what is the minimum wage in Missouri right now? Minimum wage is? You don't have a clue, right? Minimum wage is $12 in the state of Missouri? I believe it is. I don't know. Okay, so think about this, the minimum wage and multiply it by four months. So if you owed someone four months at a minimum wage, okay, calculate. Or if you owed them 20 years, that was your debt, 20 years of a minimum wage, now that would add up. But let's get where we're going. That first servant didn't owe one talent. He owed 10 thousand talents to the king in other words 2500 years of wages up to 200,000 years of wages to understand the first servant couldn't in thousands of lifetimes have paid back his debt and yet the king forgave him let this soak in because the forgiven servant goes from the king's presence set free with no longer a weight over him. And his first action is to demand repayment for a debt. The comparison is staggering. 10,000 to one. Forgiven 10,000 requiring one. You see, God offers to forgive our sin debt that we can never repay him. How many of you believe that? Amen? You can't earn salvation. You can't work for it. If you had thousands of lifetime, you could never pay him back. It is staggering. Let me illustrate it this way. Let me show you a graphic, and I know it's going to be impossible to read, but this is an actual clock in real time of the U.S. national debt. $30 trillion. And if you look in the top left corner, you see those numbers spinning? That is real time as the national debt, while you're sitting here comfortably, the national debt is increasing. It's an interesting clock because it has a time machine. You can click it and it'll go forward to 2026. And that 30 trillion number is estimated on this day in 2026 to be $40 trillion. There's lots of numbers up there. Go ahead and um, get, get it off there. You won't listen to anything that I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> It's a U.S. debt, uh, just look it up, U.S. debt clock, real time. You can uh, look at that. There's also broken down by state. You can look up the state of Missouri. and Then it's divided, take the national debt and divide it by the number of U.S. citizens, and that's the debt load. And then you divide it by U.S. taxpayers, which is a lot less than U.S. citizens, and you'll see what that debt is. And, and so here is my point. The problem with those kinds of numbers a trillion dollars, is you don't operate in that every day, right? It is so staggering that at some point we just say, it's funny money, just spend it. In fact, national debt has increased $2 trillion 
in a year. You can't get your mind around. I can't get my mind around that. But consider the national debt being erased, forgiven. And by the way, the U.S., um, out of all countries, has the largest amount of debt owned by, uh, by foreign uh, entities. 37% of U.S. debt is owned by other countries. The first country that has the greatest amount of debt that we owe, do you know who that first country? Because you're going to be wrong. Who's the first country? The greatest amount of debt. Who do you think it is? Japan. Wrong. <laughs> I knew you were going to be wrong. First country is Japan, followed closely by China. And then Switzerland, I believe, is third. What's the point here? This debt. We get to a place that we throw up our hands. We say, it's too much. I can't do anything. You know, we can do that with our sin, too. We can get so despairing about what I've done wrong in my life and my, my mistakes, which is sin, that we'll reach the place, if we're not careful, that we'll reach a place that we say, not even God can forgive me. This is the good news of the gospel. God is able and willing to forgive anyone and remove their sin. Amen? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for your immeasurable gift of grace. Think about it. God's grace is immeasurable. Look up the word immeasurable, incalculable, inestimable, innumerable, unfathomable, indeterminable. God's grace is unearned. That means you cannot merit it. You don't deserve it. You can't work for it. God's grace is undeniable. It is indisputable, indubitably. It is unquestionable beyond a shadow of a doubt, inarguably, undebatably, incontrovertibly, incontestably, irrefutably. Amazing. Those are a thesaurus. Just go find one. God's grace is unpayable. And wouldn't you agree, his grace is unforgettable. Amen? So why is it when he forgives us that we often refuse? A pastor, I know what you're saying, but you have no idea what he or she or they did to me or the people that I care about. No, I don't. But God does. And what will happen in your life and in my life if I refuse to forgive is that that bitterness and resentment will eat me alive. Pastor and author J.D. Greer, who served as president of the Southern Baptist Convention for a couple of years, he served as a missionary overseas in South Asia. He said on one instance he had a Muslim man who came to him asking why God would need somebody to die in order to forgive our sin. You see, Muslims do not believe that Jesus died on the cross, an atoning death for our sins. They do not accept, believe that Jesus is the sacrifice for our sins. They also do not believe that Jesus is the eternal one and only Son of God. So numerous differences between Christianity and um, Islam. So just parenthetically, when somebody says all religions teach the same thing, you run as fast as you can in the other direction because it's not true. Amen? Amen. So in order to explain this this, this, this Muslim man actually asked the question, you're telling me that if, that if I sinned against you, the Muslim man asked J.D. Greer, and, and I wanted to forgive you, you wouldn't make me kill my dog so that you would forgive me. This Muslim man's trying to understand why God would send his son if Christianity is true. So Greer, trying to explain it to him, say, imagine, saying to this man, imagine that you stole my car, you wrecked it and destroyed it, you have no insurance and you have no money to pay for the repairs on my automobile. He's saying to this man, now, I have two choices. One is I can go to the court. I can ask a judge to mandate that you pay for the repair of my car. 
But what if you have no money? You have no means to pay back. You would be in my debt for the rest of your life, right? Mandate it. You can't pay. You're in my debt, unable to pay. But Greer says, I have another choice, a second choice. I could forgive you. What I'm choosing to do if I forgive you, I say I forgive you, is I am going to absorb the cost of your wrong. Now, somebody has to pay for the repair of the vehicle. That's not going to be you because you can't afford it. So J.D. says, what if I pay for the cost of repair of the vehicle? I absorb the cost. And not only do I absorb the cost and repair the vehicle, but I choose to offer you friendship and acceptance, even though you don't deserve it because you destroyed my car and you cannot repair it. But I'm going to repair it, and then I offer you friendship. You see, for friendship to work, friendship for forgiveness to work, forgiveness requires a sacrifice. Don't ever forget this. Salvation is free but it cost Jesus his life. Amen? Amen? So it is free to you. It is free to me, but it is not free. When Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished. It is a Greek word, tetelestai, which means paid in full. What's paid in full? Sin's debt. And if you ask him, Forgive me, Lord Jesus. Save me, Lord Jesus. Jesus will do for you what the king did for the servant. He will say, although you cannot earn forgiveness, although you cannot pay me back, King Jesus will say to you what the king said to the servant. Forgiven. Amen? Amen. Now what are you going to do when you leave? The first person that comes, your direction who may have wronged you, are you going to get your pound of flesh from them? You see, our refusal to forgive others discredits God's forgiveness in us. The other servants who saw what was happening went straight to the king to report it. The king summoned the first servant who was the debt-free servant, and he said, you wicked servant, I forgave you all your debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you. Then the king delivered him to the torturers for his wickedness. The parable by repetition is asking us to compare these two people. A servant who's just been handed a gift likely worth lifetimes and the one who was not offered forgiveness. The king acted out of pity. He acted mercifully and forgave the debt. What a gift from the king. And the forgiven servant refuses to forgive. Where do you see yourself this morning in Jesus' story? Forgiven? Unwilling to forgive? Or are you the one who still has a debt? What are you refusing to forgive others for? Let me share several scriptures with you. You've probably heard them before. This one comes out of our passage this morning, Matthew 18. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Our unwillingness to forgive has a way of coming back on us. Matthew 6, 14, 15, this will sound familiar. It is after Jesus' disciples asked, teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Remember that? Right after he teaches, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus immediately says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ also forgave you. Several years ago, there was a best-selling book written in 2018 by Della Owens called Where the Crawdads Sing. It came out in 2022 as a movie. In it is the story of a a woman, Kaya, 
uh, who lived in Barkley Cove, North Carolina, known to all of the locals as Marsh Girl. She lived a hard, lonely, abandoned, and forgotten life, forgotten by nearly everybody except one uh, who befriended her, Tate, who became family to her. Tate went off to college and promised to return, and yet Tate did not return, did not write to her to explain why he didn't return. And years later, he did return. In the interim, much happened in Kaya's life. So when he appeared on her um, at her house to ask forgiveness, he pled with her to forgive. He said that he did what was wrong, the worst thing I've ever done in my life that I'll ever do. I've regretted it for years, and I will always regret it. I think of you every day. And so he's pouring out his heart, asking forgiveness. And so that's what she says. She says, what do you want now? And he said, if you could only in some way forgive me. And in the book, Kaya looked down at her feet and thought to herself, and she said, she said why should the injured the still bleeding, bear the onus of forgiveness. Why should the bleeding still bear the onus of forgiveness? That's really why it's so hard, isn't it? Why is it the one who is wronged is asked to forgive when the one who is wronged often has no repentant heart and no desire to receive forgiveness? Let me point out to you, the scripture is clear that genuine repentance leads to changed behavior and changed thinking. In Luke 17, verses 3 and 4, pay attention to yourselves. Jesus said, if your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive what? I don't mean to disrespect Jesus, but I mean, right? Someone wrongs you and repents and wrongs you. Not another day, but the same day, what did Jesus say? You and I are to what? Boy, that was resounding. Yes, he says that. Do you see why this is so difficult? Now notice Jesus says, if he repents, comes back to you and repents. There's a lot that's going under the name of repentance that isn't repentance. When you and I say, I'm sorry, and it's flippant, and there's no change of mind and no change of behavior, guess what? Those are empty words. So if you are the one who is wronged, and you quickly demand Hey, you got to forgive me. The Bible says you have to forgive me. And yet there is no change in your life. What foolishness. A farmer lost a sheep and a pig. They escaped through a broken area of the fence. He looked till dark, could not find them, went back the next day and finally heard the bleeding of the sheep. He found the sheep and the pig in the ravine covered in mud. The pig was wallowing in glee. And the sheep, covered in mud, was bleating as though to say, get me out of here. Now, please don't take this the wrong way. But are you a pig? <laughs> in sin, wallowing? Okay, don't take me out of context. Are you a sheep? I want to be forgiven. Amen? Amen. And I am obligated as a child of God to forgive others. Pray with me, please. Father, thank you for your word. Jesus, your words are not easy for us to digest and certainly not easy to live. And yet, remind us often of the enormous magnanimous grace you've offered to every one of us at our salvation, those of us who are saved. And God, for those in this room, those who are watching who have never repented genuinely and asked forgiveness, have not been saved, I pray that even today they would be saved. But Jesus, once we have received forgiveness, help us to forgive others. And God, we can't do it by ourselves. But help us to live lives 
that are filled with love and grace that you offer to us. I pray in Christ's name, amen. Would you stand? As we sing together, I invite you to make a response, appropriate response to Jesus for what he has done for us. Accept him as your savior. Renew your commitment. Come and unite with our church. Come for believer's baptism as we sing, just as I am, I come broken. Would you come? you grateful for the grace of God. Amen. Amen. Just, a, just a few announcements this morning. Um, this is the last Sunday that I have to come up here and be super excited about Gospel Kids kickoff because that is this Wednesday. Okay, This Wednesday, 630 to 745, is Gospel Kids Kickoff, and that is our new children's ministry replacing Awana. And so I know that they have been actively preparing. Um, Marilyn was here all day yesterday while we were here doing our fundraiser, getting things set up and ready. Um, and I'm just thankful for all of the adults that are preparing for this school year's youth, uh, children's ministry. And so we'll just continue to, to pray for them. Uh, other announcements, uh, Christmas in August, still collecting items. Um, the list uh, is here. It's also in your bulletin. So I know the table is getting full, but they still need items for that. Um, also, preschool items. I believe the list was in your bulletin. There's also a list out in the uh, foyer on the welcome table of all of the items that the children need um, in preschool this year. And then I want to thank uh, Teresa and Jessica uh, for helping yesterday. We had our craft day fundraiser. We had 35 ladies here for um, 10 to 12 hours crafting all day long. Um, and the youth did a great job serving. But that is um, a great fundraiser that we have 
um, to help offset some of the cost of, of the youth ministry. So I just thank them for their help in putting that on. So let's go ahead, uh, bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you again this morning, Lord, to just for the time that you've given us here, Lord, and for your word um, to encourage us every day. Lord, I just thank you for that. Lord, I pray that as we leave here this morning, um, that it was just not another message heard, but Lord, that we take it and we apply it to our lives. Lord, that the debt that you have forgiven in our lives, Lord, Lord, it is, it's unthinkable, it's unimaginable what you have done for us, Lord, and I just thank you for that, Lord. I pray that we will use that every day in our lives, Lord, and that we will share it with those around us. I pray these things in your son's name. Amen.